Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you here. If you're a guest here at St. Mark, a special welcome to you. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Borman. I get to be the pastor of this place. And again, welcome. Uh, the song is true. We want you to be welcomed here no matter what kind of um, breaking or suffering or sin you have in your life. We want you to know that you're welcome here. We're going to be talking about that throughout the service. The wisdom that God has for us when our lives are breaking apart in various ways. Uh, as we go along in the service, I want to invite you to just notice that you have these things in your pew racks. They're called a connection card. And if you want to get a once a week email from St. Mark, you can um, sign, put your email address. We'll give you a once a week email. Or if you're interested in other things at St. Mark, you can check the box and one of us here will reach out to you. And we also, we care about what's going on in your life. And we have a prayer team that's ready to pray for you. And so if you have something that you want to share with us and we can pray for you, put that, put that down. And then you can take these and, and place them in the offering baskets when, when they come around in the, later in the service. For right now, um, you actually heard the opening song. And hopefully that gives you a chance to participate in it as much as you can. And uh, we're welcomed by God and by each other into this place in holy worship.
you stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. When he has tested me, let us confess those times we trusted our own ability to innovate and progress. God, forgive us for our lack of humility and overconfidence in life. For our eagerness for knowledge, but not wisdom. For our failure to trust your will and way in all things. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God, now and forever. Amen. You're invited to join and sing a beautiful song of praise. Uh, this is one we've done here at St. Mark recently, and I, I want to entrust it to you to sing as you feel comfortable with this note, that we are God's garden, and as his vineyard, uh, he does trim us sometimes. And so... We praise him.
Let's pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need and keep us safe in your care. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today, we're thinking about wisdom and suffering, is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And here we start to discern one of the purposes that God has for us in suffering. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. The word of the Lord. At this time, I want to invite you to Hear the wisdom of wisdom itself, Jesus. Please stand out of respect for him and his teaching. Here Jesus shows us that sometimes he in his wisdom lets death come to give us resurrection life. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with them. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Uh, We have a hymn of the day. Um, It's called Afflicted Saint to Christ Draw Near. And there's themes here in this hymn as we get into them that will prepare you well as we continue in our Job sermon series.
I get to read to you right here, right now, as we continue our Job sermon series, an inspired poem. And I want you to just invite you to experience it as a journey. There is a mine for silver. You got to picture this. And a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted with ore. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Lapis lazuli comes from its rocks and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows that hidden path. No falcon's eye has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it and no lion prowls there. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all its treasures. They search for the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. The sea says, it is not in me. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought with the gold of Ophir, with precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of, of, of mention. The price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of Cush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. Where, then, does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and the path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord. Here's the key verse. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. The word of the Lord. Uh, this is true confession time. I, sometimes I fight in myself with uh, sermon introductions. Sometimes I found that with this, with this particular poem. Part of, it's, part of it's because I want to serve you well. I understand that you're like me. And when you come to a place like this, you can actually come with a lot on your mind and a lot on your heart. And so that, so that when you do, you, you are, you're going to have a need to know that if you actually pay attention in church, if you just unload all that stuff for a second, it's going to be worth it. So, so I realize that when I start out speaking, it is, I, I sense it as an act of love and service to you to tell you and show you it's going to be worth it. But there's tension in it for me because on the one hand, Here's what happens. If I come at you too hard 
and too thick and too fast, it's too much. And you'll shut down. And that's not nice to kind to you. On the other hand, if I come to you at you too shallow and too fun, and I start talking about my golf game, and I say things like, it's non-existent, I don't play golf, what I do is hack. Then I am, I'm signaling to you that what I'm going to say next isn't that weighty. It's not worth much. So I, so I have to find the middle. Not too heavy, not too soft. But see, the tension for me goes even deeper because here's what happens. Every Sunday morning, I'm way ahead of you, not because I'm actually ahead of you, but because I'm, I've been thinking about this all week and you just showed up. And what I really want to do is, see, what I really want to do is I just want to start talking about the scripture. I just want to talk about it. I want to skip all that, all that introductory fun, all that stuff, get you involved. I just want to skip all of it. And what I want to do is I want to take this, this is, my, this is what I often want to do. I just want to take it, I want to, like it's a diamond, and I just want to just reveal it to you, facet by facet by facet, so you can see all the beauty of it. Just get into it. But it demands a lot of you. Because what it demands of you as a listener is an act of faith. That what's coming is going to matter to you. And so I don't do that much. But I'm going to do it today. Because I think this is immediately interesting. What's the very first thing that happens? The very first thing that happens is you, you encounter Mining. Human mining. In fact, you might be interested to know that this is, this is a picture of 4,000-year-old mining, which is pro probably makes it the oldest description of human mining that you'll find anywhere in human literature. Wow. Miners. And what happens, you can see, what you have to do is you have to take the journey. Job says, here's what's going on in ancient mining. They go down. Way, way, way down 4,000 years ago. They would do it. They would, they, the, the humans, they would come and they would dig this shaft. And I'm getting claustrophobic just thinking about that. <laughs> but they dig this shaft and they go way, way down, Job says in the poetry, so that the homes where people actually live are way up, and you almost look up, and you can see the pinprick of the daylight above. And there they are, on these rickety elevators, swaying to and fro, Job says. They've got, these, they've got these little contained fires. Can you picture that? Like little lanterns, ancient lanterns, and there they are swaying to and fro. OSHA's not involved back then. Swaying to and fro, and they're bumping along the sides of the shaft that they've created. And what Job says is it worked. See, they would go down there and they would create these fires and they would bust open the rocks and there they would find the iron and they'd just start smelting the ore out of it. And it worked. It all worked. These were human beings who went where no human being had ever gone before. And it worked. Actually, Job, Job takes it further than I just did. Job actually says, not just human beings that never went there before, no creature on earth did. See, humans, humanity is, is like nothing else. See, the falcon, the prince of the sky can see a long ways, but it cannot and it will not ever see the hidden paths underground. For that, you got to be a human. The lion might be the king of the savannah. It might be a proud beast. It might have lordship there, but you'll never find it underground. You'll never find it leaving its home for a pinprick of daylight way above you. Never for that. You got to be human. 
And we've done it. I mean, we've done it. We've really done it. And Job tells you, you were even doing it 4,000 years ago. They were finding topaz and, and gold and, and lapis lazuli. We were not going to go after so sapphires because they didn't know, know about so far, so sapphires 4,000 years ago. Lapis lazuli was the best kind of gem that you could find, they thought. But it worked. Well, what are we supposed to do with that? <laughs> to him. First of all, we can acknowledge this. Is, wow. Human progress. Wow. You got to take off for a moment our 2024 pride. Just take it away for a second. And because some of you are sitting there and saying, but we have Caterpillar today. Like that company? We have that. We have boring technology. We have that. We have boring technology. Come on. Stop it. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And we had to start somewhere. These giants. See, the bravery, the courage, the entrepreneurship to do this, to cross boundaries, to push forward. Wow. Stop for a second and acknowledge that. Wow. Now the scholars, really interesting scripture. I told you, it's interesting. Isn't it really interesting? The, schol the scholars are right. What is, what is going on here in Job chapter 28 at the beginning? The scholars say, this is what's happening. This is a hymn to humanity. It's an ode. It's a song. Wow, humans. Oh, wow, look at the humans. They do what nobody else, the courage, the admiration. See, it's a hymn to humanity. Wow. It's, 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 it's true. Can, can, we, can we do it? Can we just, can we sing a little bit? I was, in a, I was in a hospital room with a man a few years ago, and he sang a little hymn like that. He said, the marvels of modern medicine. Wow. You know, we can celebrate this. Look, make it personal for a second. My mom had stage four cancer. She wouldn't be here if it weren't for MD Anderson. They had the right cancer targeting drugs. Wow. Somebody tested. Somebody didn't stop. Somebody dared. Some, somebody entrepreneur. Wow, humanity. Somebody did it. You know, push the borders. Push the borders. He, we, we are living in a generation right now, we more than anybody else, can look back and see human progress. Can't you see it? Let's look. Okay, we've gone down. I already told you, we got Caterpillar, we have boring technology. We can go, we can go today to the, to the most extreme environments on earth and, and we can get out of the ground hundreds of different types of things. We can, we can get more than just minerals and rocks and stuff like that. We frack and we drill and we get gas and we get oil. Come on, we have gone down. We've taken submarines and we have gone thousands of feet below the surface of the water. We've done it in 4K. You can watch it on Netflix. We've gotten somewhere. We've taken, we haven't just gone down, we've gone up. We've landed on the moon. China just got stuff from the dark side of the moon. We shoot up satellites. We've gone down. We've gone up. We've gone in. We have cracked, in my lifetime, the human genome. <laughs> we have come up with words to describe what we've seen, quark and lepton. We've split the atom to do it. We've learned some stuff so that today, think of it. We ride on clouds. They're called airplanes. We call each other from thousands, or talk to each other from thousands of miles away with perfect clarity. 
They're called cell phones. We made the internet. And think of how amazing this is. You can walk into Hy-Vee this morning, pick up a little bag, and inside of it, there will be a perfectly manicured row of Oreos. Wow. And somebody at some point even once did this. They took a little bit of grain and some malt sugars and some yeast and they made beer. Who thought of that? Well, what are we supposed to do with all this? <laughs> First, let no one ever tell you that the Bible doesn't celebrate humanity at some level. God has baked in so much courage and ingenuity and daring in humanity. Let no one say that the Bible is an attack on science or technology or progress. But, that's not my word, that's Job's word, but. Where is all the wisdom? Where is all the understanding of this, in this? But. Actually, Job, he, see, Job continues to turn. He goes down in a, in, a, in a miner's mind. But then he starts looking around. Where's wisdom? Is it, is it down there in the mind? Is it down there in the progress? No, it's not down there. I can't find it. Can, can I buy it with all the gems that I find, find down there, with all the mining, the gold and the topaz and stuff? Can I, can I buy it? Can I buy it? Can I buy it anywhere? I can't buy it anywhere. I can't, can't even buy it. N nothing. We, uh, well, okay, I'll try, I'll try down in the place of the dead. I'll go six feet under. They, they've only heard a rumor about it. It's actually not there either. I can't find wisdom. Let me, let me put it like this. What is, so what's Job saying? He's saying this. This is an awful and great paradox of humanity. As much progress as we've made, we have gotten absolutely nowhere. Oh, okay. Don't just take that as a claim. Let, let, me, let me try to prove it. Okay, we, we made beer. We unlocked the grape. It's called wine. What do we get? Alcoholism. We made Facebook, right? We made Facebook. What are we, what are we now? More depressed than ever before. See, so keep going. We, what, what did we do? We contained fire. We learned how to contain and control fire. What did we do with it? We made guns. That's what we did. We made guns. We cracked the atom. What do we do with it? You know. You, maybe you watch the movie. It's called Oppenheimer. Yeah, we made the internet. Great, we made the internet. You know what people say? Most of it is pornography. See? I, I, look, I do this all day. I correct the genome. We struggle. I say this all, with all compassion. We struggle today to know what an X and a Y chromosome means. You can think out what that means. We str say this with all compassion. We, well, we have Oreos. And now the hottest drug on the market is Ozempic. <sighs> Where's all the wisdom? Now, what, what, ha, I got to draw meaning out of that. <laughs> it's wisdom. What can we learn? What can we learn? What can we learn? There's, there, there's a scientist by the name of Rosalind Picard. She's a scientist professor at MIT in Boston. And here's what she says about science and technology and progress. Here's what she, here's what she says. I'm not saying it. This is what she says. Science is a way of gaining knowledge. It's, a, it's not the way. It's a way. It's one of the ways humans gain knowledge. It's just one. Like, 
what you can make observations, you understand things, you can, you can, you can make some things out of that. So it's a way of gaining knowledge. But you know what else is history? It's history is a way to gain knowledge. You, you can get eyewitness testimony, you can learn how things work. History is a way to gain knowledge. You know what else is? Literature. Literature is a way to gain knowledge. Literature is a way to learn more about the human experience. See, science, literature, history, all of these are ways of gaining knowledge, but not the knowledge, not the truth. Where do you find that? See, we got, science can never tell you why you're here. It can, it'll never tell you what to do with all your learnings. It can never tell you. It can never give you your purpose. It can never, never tell you anything. Never, this is Rosalind Picard. Never give you the truth about life. For that, you got to go somewhere else. But, 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 but why? But why is Job pressing on this here? Let me tell you what you probably already know. Those of you who are suffered have suffered. When you suffer, you come up short. That's not my language. That's, that's the language of survivors. When you, go, when you go through something, you come up short. Well, you bump up against it. The things that you used to be believe, you th thought were true, you realize some of those things are not true at all. You have actually bumped up against it. You come up short. And you start asking yourself, where in the world can I make meaning from this? Where in the world can I, can I understand what is actually happening in my life? You, come up, you, you realize suddenly, I cannot do it. I have come up short. The, the, the knowledge that I have, the power that I have, it can't shape my life's direction ultimately. Where is the wisdom? Where is the meaning? How can I do it? See, what you want, this is what Job is tapping into. This is what he's realizing. What you want when you have broken, when you have come up against it, when you have come up short, is you want so much more than one plus one equals two. You're not a calculator. You can go on ChatGBT, and you can ask ChatGBT, how, how can I interview well? How can I pay, make people like me better? But you know what? It'll never teach you what it means to be loved and what it means to love and what all of life means. For that, you'll go looking everywhere in humanity. You can go down in the mines, you can go all the way to the progress, you can go all the way to the depths, you can even talk, if you, if you, you can go down to the realms of the dead. You're not going to find it. It's not here. It's not among us. And suffering is when you break open and you're willing to see it. And Job takes advantage of that and says, where can you find it then? He says, I went looking for every I went looking everywhere. And this is what he says. It's in God. God knows. See, the, uh, he's, this is what he says. He says, the God who made the ends of the earth, the God who made the wind, the God who's charted the path of the, th the sun, thunderstorm, the God who made it all all of life, all of the universe, all of the things that we've discovered. He made all of it. He's the only one who knows what life is about. The fear of the Lord. See? Here's something human race. The fear of the Lord by the way, that's the Old Testament's way of speaking about faith. People who trust in the Lord, that's wisdom. You're not, you're not going to find it in progress. You're not going to find the answers in science. You're not going to find it there. Where are you going to find it? <laughs> the... the 
I'm, this is not a Christian claim. It's not a uniquely Christian claim. Jesus is the most transformational person who ever lived. That is not, that's not a uniquely Christian claim. In, anybody who's lived in the world knows that. It's not unique. Jesus is the most transformational person who ever lived, bar none. Everybody acknowledges that. My question is why? Now we know this, right? We know this. This is why still today, everybody, not just Christians, everybody is counting up from Jesus. It's been all oh, about 2,024 years since him. <laughs> he's the watershed moment. He's, he's the hinge of history. He's everything. Everybody can, it's the most transformational person. Everybody knows this. Why? <laughs> Something to think about. Did he build skyscrapers? No, no, didn't do that. <laughs> you know, did he, did he give us little sketches, you know? Little, little like roads. I, I'm sure he was the greatest physicist ever. Never gave us any physics. Better than, I, better than Newton, better than Einstein. Didn't give us any physics. You know, little roads to cancer drug. No, no, didn't do the little roads to cancer drug. Didn't do that. Why? Why is it? Because. Don't you see? He crossed all the borders that mattered. And this is a uniquely Christian claim. He came from heaven to earth. He came from light to darkness. He came from the wisdom of God to the foolishness of humanity. It's not my language. It's, it's the language of the Bible. The people walking in darkness. I'm quoting the prophet right now. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. He's the light in the darkness. Came from heaven to earth. Went mining. Spelunked down here. Oh, but he crossed more borders than that, didn't he? He, went, he came down, but he went lower than that, and then he went higher than that, and then he went more inward than that, because what he actually did is this. He went all the way to hell and suffered for us there. And he went all the way to the heights of the cross and exalted himself there. And he went all the way into the heart of human darkness, our own hearts, and died for all that's there. And wisdom is knowing that. Wisdom is knowing him, that he loves you so. No, we, we haven't left the book of Job. It's about suffering. How so? Do you realize that we just made our first advance into understanding it? We just advanced. Actually, we advanced in a really significant way. I, I, this is what I think. I think that the Holy Spirit gave us an image of mining on purpose. 4,000-year-old image of mining. Why? Because that's what suffering feels like. It feels like you're in a hole. It feels like you're rattling around. It feels claustrophobic, and you get vertigo and you don't know which way is up. And we just, in the midst of that, took our first step forward. And it's this. God loves you. And he's over everything. And so your suffering must not be there to hurt you. That's an advance, isn't it? Your suffering's not going to hurt you. It can't hurt you. That's an advance. That's a, that's a bigger advance. Right, right here, right now, you have something more important than airplanes and Oreos and, and Ozempic. All of it. Because you know that. 
And so if it's not there to hurt you, as we've learned in our mining, well, I'm going to quote a Christian song. Here and now, I'm in the fire, in above my head, being held under pressure, don't know what will be left. But it's here in the ashes I'm finding treasure. He's making diamonds. Diamonds. Making diamonds out of dust. He's making diamonds out of us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you know even better than we do that suffering is a hole and a pit and darkness and constriction. When we're in those places that can feel so hopeless, give us your wisdom today to see that there under pressure, you're loving us and changing us and making us exactly who you want us to be, diamonds in Christ. Amen. Please stand and let's confess our faith in the God we trust, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Um, Please do um, feel free to take those connection cards uh, in your pew racks and um, fill those out and place them in the offering baskets as they come around right now.
Please stand. We're going to spend some time here in prayer, and there'll be a chance at the end when you can bring whatever you have on your heart to your God who loves you. One special thing that I wanted to point out is we're in a, uh, we're inter been introducing this campaign called, called the Because Jesus Campaign, where we're thinking about how we can share the hope of Jesus with others, and we're going to be praying for that campaign. Maybe you saw the, the campaign sign in our Welcome Center this morning. Let's join together in prayer. O Lord, from whom our help comes, you have brought us into your holy Christian church and made Christ our shield from every enemy. Give us such powerful faith that we are convinced that through suffering, you turn us into diamonds. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, the help of all, we lift all those who suffer to you. Consider their pain with compassion and for the sake of Jesus, redeem it for your good and saving purposes. Lord, in your mercy, give courage to your church, O Lord, that as we believe, so we also would speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the confident hope we have in him, that we too will be raised and brought into his presence. Embolden us by your spirit to confess this Christian faith from a lively conscience that for Christ's sake, grace may extend to more and more people and increase thanksgiving to your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Spirit, we especially lift to you today our Because Jesus campaign. We ask, Lord, that you impress on us the joy of our mission to share Jesus. We further ask that you would give us resolve and commitment to it. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for the various structures of society. We pray for parents and their children. Bond them together in love and service. We pray for government and nations. May there be harmony and peace. We pray for the weather, land, and animals. May there be prosperity and growth. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Father, you see that we are perishing, yet you bid us to set our fears aside and trust in you for the sake of Christ, by whose blood we have received peace for our troubled consciences. Do not reject our prayers for their faithlessness, but teach us to trust in you fully. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us now, Lord, as we pray those prayers we know and feel in our hearts. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Today, for his sake, hear our prayers. Amen. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom in the power, in the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Let's sing a beautiful hymn to close. Um, pray that it speaks to your hearts.
Thank you for a beautiful song, worship team, and the peace that I pray that it gives to all of us here. Here's some things. Um, I'm just picking up stuff from your bulletin here, just real quick. Um, things that are coming up. St. Mark Summer Nights, love for you to come. July 31st will be our next one. Thanks to all of you who came. Really, really, it was a lot of fun, and there was a really nice turnout. And again, you're all invited to come to the next one. Bring your friends, bring your family, and um, come out for the fun and the fellowship. Um, July 31st here at St. Mark. Ladies Fellowship events coming up even quicker than that. Um, and you can see the, the notes for that and how to get in touch with that. Same thing for Men's Center coming up very, very quickly. And then also I want to draw your attention to a new women's small group um, for moms that's going to be happening here over the summer. And there's a write-up for you of, of that as well if you want to check that out. Um, moms. Um, finally, we have um, our Because Jesus campaign. We're just sharing encouragements right now. And um, Audrey, if you want to get situated, 
Audrey, I'm going to be interviewing Audrey in just a second. In, out in our Welcome Center, you're going to see a big sign that says, Because Jesus. And uh, what's there are three invitations that we're asking people to think about. Uh, the first one is inviting someone to a worship event like um, St. Mark Summer Nights or to a Sunday morning. The second is to invite people to speak um, to, to the pastor. I guess that'd be me. And uh, thirdly, uh, would be to give a witness to Jesus to somebody in your life. Maybe it's a spouse or a friend or a family member. Just uh, have a spiritual conversation about Jesus. And we, we put out um, the campaign sign out there. And maybe you'll notice that we also put um, a bucket of stickers there. And you might further notice that there are stickers on the sign. Those stickers represent people at St. Mark who have done those invitations. And if you're not, this is a little complicated, but if you're really paying attention, you'll notice that you can actually grab the sticker that you did. So if you invited somebody to a worship event, you can match the color and then stick it on there. But if you didn't do that, that's okay. The point is you're encouraging people like, wow, we're in this together, we're in mission together, and you can pray. You can pray for all these invitations that are happening everywhere. Last Sunday, we talked about how we can invite somebody to a worship event. Audrey's going to help us think through how we can invite somebody to speak um, with pastors. So I've, I got a few questions for you, Audrey. Uh, first of all, Audrey, you, I know you have always um, cared about evangelism and sharing Jesus with people. It's baked into your life. Why? What are some of the things that have shaped you for that? Uh, well, first, if uh, you're looking at me and you're like, wow, those big glasses are really familiar. Where do I know her from? Uh, I'm Audrey. I'm usually up here singing as a part of the, the worship service, but I've been a member here for, I think, almost two years now. Uh, my story with evangelism, I guess I'd say, uh, my parents are both Wells teachers, so they uh, went to the same school as all of our teachers over at Risen Savior, and so uh, I've always been around people who are interacting with their community, encouraging them to get involved in church events and become a part of church family. Uh, I'm not really a door-to-door -door knock kind of person. Uh, my favorite part about being a part of a church is the community and the relationships that you get being a part of a congregation. So that's kind of where my experience and emphasis comes from. Audrey, uh, St. Mark's thinking about these three invites, and we said they're inviting somebody to a St. Mark event, meeting with pastor, um, and then giving a witness to Jesus. What do you think makes the opportunity to invite somebody to speak with a pastor unique and important? Yeah, I think the asking someone to meet with pastor directly is actually a really nice and unique opportunity, just because of the virtue of coming to one hour-long service on a Sunday, it's not going to answer every question that you yourself or someone that you care about has ever had. And oftentimes, I feel like, at least in my experience, the things that hold people back from becoming more involved in church are things that are a little deeper and a little more personal. And actually meeting with someone one-on-one -on -one who has a lot of experience talking to people that way and has the theological knowledge to back it up, I think is a very effective tool that we have in our tool belt. What, uh, when, how people think about this, Audrey, what circumstances do you see especially helpful um, to make that suggestion or that invite? For sure. Uh, in my personal experience, it kind of gets divided into two different categories. One is very theological based, so if people have very strong feelings about specific social issues or they've been involved in church but they have different ideas of doctrine, having someone to actually dissect those things, kind of talk about those things in a, uh, a much more nitty gritty way than you would get in a general sermon, I think is very helpful. And then the other things are uh, very personal. So, you know, uh, things like having uh, traumatic experiences, there's death in the family, or, you know, there's just something that is very personal and affecting that 
you yourself might not be for, uh, thoroughly equipped to actually discuss with that person. I know I'm, you know, I'm obviously very young, but I'm sure my parents aren't equipped to even discuss everything ever with anyone ever. So having someone who's more experienced to be able to uh, discuss those things in an appropriate way, I think is very helpful. Thank you, Audrey. One last question for you here. Are there words, strategies, or a story or anything really that uh, you think would find uh, people would find encouraging as they think about this invitation? Uh, the the refrain I've been thinking about as I've been hearing about this campaign and thinking about it myself is the idea that it does not all rely on you. Uh, I know at least in my life, growing up in, in a Wells church, like I've always thought, oh, evangelism, that's someone going out and walking 10 blocks, walking on every person's door, and it's because of them that so-and-so comes and stays at a church. And while that may be true in some cases, I think it's a little more complex than that. It takes a village to have someone have a good experience at a church. There's the person that invites them. There's the pastor that's running the service. There's the worship crew. There's the person that talks to them while they're grabbing a donut on their way out of the door to ask them how their day is doing. It is not all on you. And I think this specific one, like having someone talk to pastor is very exemplary of that truth. Thank you, Audrey. I, I call her up on Monday and say, would you be willing to do this? And that's what I've been doing. And people at St. Mark say yes. So thank Audrey with me for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Audrey Schilling. Out in the Welcome Center, if you want to do this, we, we wanted to empower you. We, there's actually pastor business cards, which might be useful for you too. I love getting phone calls from you guys. So grab one of those. They're on the table to the right, just behind the campaign poster. Um, pass their business cards, stick them in your wallet or wear it, what, your purse or whatever. And also, there's there's St. Mark's stationery there. So if you want to um, write an invitation and send it by mail, it's free and it's for you and it's right there by the campaign sign. I'm done with one last introduction. We have um, a special new family with us. Um, the principal, uh, the new principal of our school, Risen Savior, has arrived to town as of Monday. We welcomed him amidst the flooding, and it is the Stevens family, and I got their permission to introduce them to you guys. There's Adam um, and <laughs> Tiffany, and well, Tiffany's gone, but there's our new principal. Welcome to the Stevens family. And everybody, everybody have a great 4th of July. Thank you for being here, and um, God's peace be with you all. <laughs>